In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right, to reset a little bit from last time. Last time we kind of introduced the infancy narratives. We talked about some of the basics of scriptural exegesis, because as I said when I created this uh, series a year ago, what I was really trying to do was cleverly disguise a class on scriptural exegesis as a series of Advent reflections. Um, not that cleverly, because I'm not disguising it, I'm telling you exactly what I'm doing. Um, I prefer to let you know how the sausage is made when it comes to things like this. Um, so we talked about how to define and delimit and to establish the text that we are studying and how to break them up into units for further study, which um, I, I talked about what are the narrative units that we're looking at in both Luke's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel. These are not an absolute thing by any stretch of the imagination. They're just a helpful way for us to organize them. Depending on what the focus of your study was, you might organize the material differently. Um, I've been doing some studies in Luke kind of on my own um, where I'm looking at uh, the different sort of thematic threads that run through his gospel that are a little more, he emphasizes certain things more than the other evangelists do. And so I've been going through and I'll take a chapter and every time one of those themes comes up and I write down the verse that it goes into so that at the end I'll collate it and say, okay, so here's all the references to women and it's in you know this chapter and verse and this chapter and verse and this chapter and verse and here's all the references, here are all the parables and here's where they occur and here's all the references to angels and things like that. So depending on what we're trying to study, we might take it apart and put it back together a little bit differently. For this, we're just looking again kind of at the narrative as sort of a linear structure, particularly as it you know, kind of looks, sort of resembles its, its parallels in Matthew. But again, as I was saying, we might even make the point that they don't really have anything in common, that the narratives don't really parallel each other at all. Um, we talked about why Matthew and Luke have infancy narratives. Matthew is, is trying to show you that Jesus is the Messiah. Matthew is trying to show you the human origins of Jesus. Um, Luke is uh, trying to also show you something of the human origins of Jesus, but also to situate that in history, because Luke is a good historian. Luke has a very clear Greco-Roman background in his, in his education, and we'll see some very uh, solid examples of that as we get into the stuff unique to Luke tonight. Um, we talked about why Mark and John don't have infancy narratives. Mark is in a hurry. Mark wants to get to the point um, because Mark is writing probably under siege. He's writing to encourage Christians under persecution, and so he's writing, he wants to get right to who Jesus is and when his ministry starts, and to, to not be troubled so much with the, the earlier details um, and got into then the principle of backward growth, that backward growth, the most developed part of the gospel is going to be the proclamation of the death and resurrection of Jesus because that's the most important thing. The very earliest proclamation of the gospel, probably one of our earliest creedal statements is found in the letters of Paul when he says Jesus is Lord. Three words, there you go. That's the basic, you know, um, kind of proclamation of the gospel and everything grew out from there, grew backwards from there. So if Jesus died and rose from the dead, then we need to know what he did to get put to death and why we should care that he died and rose from the dead, other than, you know, rising from the dead is kind of a neat trick and not many people ever really do that, um, meaning like basically nobody else, distinct from being raised from the dead by Jesus himself, of course. Um, and then if you say, okay, well, if this is what he did, if this is his ministry, who was he, where did he come from? And those things will come in uh, you know, at a later stage of development of telling the gospel narrative. Um, this is going to be especially important when we try to date when did the gospel of Luke come about. Um, Luke is probably much later, uh, written before John, but written after Matthew and Mark. Um, and then the order that Matthew and Mark are written in is disputed. You could say Matthew was written first and then Mark. I think it's more plausible to say Mark was written first. There are a variety of theories on this. All of them are, um, are there are a variety of worthy theories on this and um, you are free to adopt whichever one you want. Uh, kind of an, as a little aside, when talking about matters of church teaching, there isn't really a church teaching on things like that. That there is, there is freedom to adopt a viewpoint on certain things, and that's one of those things, is, is kind of an academic question like that, a scholarly question of, you know, when was the gospel written? 
Um, obviously, if, if you want to say that the gospel was written by aliens in the year 400, that's probably going to take you a little bit beyond the pale of church teaching, but that's no problem with church teaching at that point so much as it is one of sanity. So, um, We talked about the com common narrative points, and again, I gave you that handy timeline that, um, like I said, a good friend of mine uh, was very excited to make. I sent the information I wanted, and it turned into a timeline in 30 minutes. It's kind of neat to watch um, because I'm garbage with computers. Uh, those black points are the things that they have in common. Both Matthew and Luke have a genealogy because, again, both of them are trying to talk about the human origins, the human background of Jesus. But they put the genealogy in a different place. Matthew leads with the genealogy. It's the very beginning of his gospel. Um, Luke actually puts it, the infancy narrative will end, and then 22 verses will go by, and then he will stick it in there. So Jesus is an adult by the time we get around to talking about his genealogy in Luke. We'll talk about that next time, because next time is mostly going to be about why they say what they say in their genealogies, because they're actually different. Um, and it will drive us to madness, not nearly as badly as the flight into Egypt will. Um, the birth of Christ is a common narrative point. Um, and it's, it's interesting to note, Matthew actually says very little about it. He just kind of says that it happened. Um, Luke will go into a little bit more detail, and we'll go into that. The adoration of Christ, I'm calling a common narrative point because it's to show that there was some adoration going on, but who's doing the adoring and when they do it is different. Uh, we see the adoration of the Magi uh, in Matthew and of the shepherds in Luke, um, and this will reflect, at least for Matthew, something of what he's trying to get across in his gospel. Matthew's audience is mostly Jewish. He wants to emphasize to them that the Messiah isn't just coming to save the Jews. He's coming to save all people. The Magi are Zoroastrians. They are from Persia. They are a, a, a Gentile people. And he's trying to show that, that Jesus has come to say that, that even the Gentiles, even these astrologers, can study the signs in the heavens. They can see the way creation was structured and find out that there has to be a Messiah. For an interesting sort of reflection on that, Fulton Sheen's Life of Christ, which is probably one of the more, I think, one of the better entries into that genre. There's basically a whole literary genre of sort of novelizations of the life of Jesus, and it's not something modern. It goes back centuries. I mean, the, that in the Middle Ages, that was a fairly common thing to kind of take the gospel narrative and, and make it into a more sort of prosy story, basically. Um, and there are several authors in more, in more recent times that have done a very nice one like that. Um, Romano Guardini, the German theologian of Italian parentage, obviously, who was much beloved by both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Um, Pope Francis cites him almost as much as he does John Paul and Benedict. Um, and he, he wrote one called The Lord. And it's a series of narratively ordered um, kind of reflections on the life of Jesus. So he takes each one. You could, you could pick up the book and just read them, read them individually. They're written almost as individual essays about this part of his ministry or his passion or things like that. Um, but they're, they're put in order, so you can kind of read them, as, read them also kind of in that sort of novel way. Um, the same with Fulton Sheen's. Fulton Sheen, in the introduction to his, he talks about um, how Christ was the only birth that was pre-announced, the only birth in history that was pre-announced, that was foretold not only... Kind of immediate to him, but was, there was prophecy kind of indicating this, and it wasn't something just confined to what we would call the Old Testament, that he talks about how you can read all these ancient writings from other civilizations than the Hebrew people, and they, they have some sense that there's something not quite right about the world, and that there's got to be somebody to come along to make it right, and you can read it in the poetry of the, of the Roman poets, you can read it in the Greek philosophers, you can read it in, um, you know, he talks about all these other different civilizations, East and West, and it's fascinating to see that everybody kind of knew that we, we needed a Christ. We needed someone to set right what was just not quite right about the world. Um, so, that aside. Um, then the uh, childhood of Christ. There's a brief editorial comment of two verses in both Gospels that says something about the childhood of Jesus. Those are the common points. Um, so tonight we're actually going to get into, and like I said, we could say that they have zero in common because of how they, there's only really one event that they both talk about in the, in the infancy narrative, and that's the birth of Christ itself. And even the way they do it is very different. Because like I said, Matthew just kind of says that it happened. Um, Luke has some detail 
not a ton, but he has some, you can see that that's only six, only seven verses. Um, we could say that there are up to four common points. I'm saying that one for a scholarly reason, namely that it gives a greater cohesion to the two narratives. If we want to put them side by side and kind of see how they complement one another, it's easier to see that when we say that there are four points in common. I'm also doing it for a pragmatic reason in that I don't have to come up with more material because then in the first talk I get to talk about all four of those instead of zero of them. So um, sometimes we do these things for more mercenary intentions as it were. I'm drinking very, very heavy coffee, so I will probably talk faster as this goes on. Um, so when you get on YouTube tonight to see what you missed in the latter half of the talk, because I was talking too fast, you can actually slow it down. Um, I found there's a, there's a political commentator I sometimes listen to. I listen to a range of political commentary on, on YouTube, and uh, there's one who talks very fast, and I slowed, his, slowed him down to three-fourths speed, and he sounds like a normal human at that point. Um, I slowed it down to half speed, and he sounded drunk. So, um, so slow me down to 75, and you should, you should be fine, 75%. So we're talking about Luke tonight. Why are we talking about Luke first? Because, you know, when I open my Bible, this is not my Bible. It's one that was on the shelf in my office um, that was here when I got here. But when I open my Bible, Luke is not first. Matthew is first. Um, and when I look even at the narrative structure... Luke isn't first. Matthew talks about the genealogy first. Why would I want to talk about Luke first? Um, Matthew is older material. Matthew was written first. This is not in dispute. Um, Luke basically says this at the beginning of his gospel, that he looked at everything everybody had written before, and now he's doing his own kind of take on this to explain it to a different audience at a slightly different time, probably a couple of decades removed from when Mark and Matthew put pen to paper. Or Matthew and Mark, if that's your theory, you know, I will entertain uh, entertain alternate theories. Um, why don't we read them in composition order? The reason we're doing this is because Luke's narrative itself, the genealogy isn't really part of the narrative. It's kind of the background material to it. Kind of like how the Star Wars prequels aren't really part of the Star Wars story. They're background material that you don't even really need because they're terrible and you can just start with episode four because it's, you know, those three movies are the only ones that matter. Um, because the narrative actually begins earlier in the, in the actual story itself, and not just sort of the historical background, with the coming of John the Baptist, it makes sense then if we're going to put these in story order to start there. So if you look at, um, if you look at our timeline, really the first event that happens in the timeline is that promise of John the Baptist that we hear about early in the Gospel of Luke. Um, Matthew places the genealogy first, so we're not talking about him, but we're not talking about him first even though the genealogy, again, kind of happens first. Um, it's just going to be more useful for us to talk about Luke first, since the center of the whole study is the birth and the infancy of Christ. We need to look at the things more immediately, the, the things that happened immediately closer to the story. Also, um, when I was, part of the reason I did Luke first is that Luke is easier to study than Matthew. Um, when I, and I have actually an aside in my notes from when I wrote this last year, that I needed more time to prep on the genealogy and the uh, flight into Egypt because they were going to give us headaches. Um, so the core in the infancy narrative really begins earlier in Luke than in Matthew because we have um, also the, the origins of John the Baptist in there too. So a slight, a, a short review of Luke. Again, his audience was a mixed Jewish and Gentile audience. They were familiar both, Luke himself is familiar with both Jewish customs and Greco-Roman history and politics. His audience is probably more affluent. Luke talks about money and the poor a lot. Luke is sometimes called the gospel of the poor. Luke is sometimes called the gospel of the rich um, for largely the same reasons, because he's talking a lot about the poor because his audience is very rich, and he wants to emphasize to them the plight of the poor and their duty toward them. Um, and again, like I said, Luke will sometimes in very clever ways show that he's talking to rich people, um, where Matthew will talk about money. If he mentions silver, Luke will sometimes upgrade that to gold. That would be roughly the equivalent of where Matthew talks about a Toyota. Um, Luke is going to change that to a BMW in that parable. So, um, you know, because his audience, it would be beneath them to own Toyotas, basically. Um, there are some distinctive features and emphases in Luke's gospel. Um, angels and women play a prominent role in Luke. Um, in the first two chapters, we're going to hear a lot from Mary and Elizabeth. Almost everything that, really everything that Mary is recorded as having said in Scripture is found in the Gospel of Luke. Um, that happens quite frequently in Luke's Gospel. 
there will be a story that he has in common, some parable or some, some event that he has in common with Matthew or Mark or both, but women will play a more prominent role. Women might do more of the talking or, or drive more of the action for Luke. Um, and again, um, the, the, one of the main ways you see this in here is that um, Mary and Elizabeth get a, lot of, get a lot of play in these two chapters. Look at that over and against the roles of Zechariah and Joseph. Zechariah, uh, or Joseph says nothing. We have no recorded words of Joseph anywhere in Scripture, even in Luke, where we have a lot of information about the Holy Family. Zechariah literally has a non-speaking part because he'll get struck dumb. So the women do all the talking, and the men actually don't speak. Um, and when Zechariah does, it's only briefly, and he you know, sticks his foot in his mouth and gets struck dumb by an angel. Luke is writing an orderly account. He says in the, very, in the first four verses of his gospel, he's explaining what it is he's doing. He looks at what everybody has done before. He wants to produce, as he says, an orderly account. And what he means to do by that is to write good history. Um, he's very well educated. His Greek is the best Greek in the New Testament. Um, the other end of the spectrum, as I said last week, is Mark. Mark writes Greek that is not good Greek, but it is good Aramaic. Mark is writing Greek like a seventh grader whose first language was not Greek. Um, Luke is writing very good Greek, um, and he's using Greco-Roman histori historiographical methods, uh, one of which will be very important to the infancy narrative, and I'll point that out as we go. I've actually already marked that out on here. He likely knew Mary, and I talked a lot about that last time, if I'm not mistaken. I know that I've talked about that at least four or five times in the last two weeks to people because I find that idea fascinating. Um, little side note here on kind of evaluating the claims of piety, because there are a lot of things that come down to us by way of sort of pious legends and things like that, and we have to evaluate, you know, is there good historical proof for the claim? And I don't think it's a good idea to just dismiss something out of hand because devotion is how we get it. There's a certain school of thought that's been around for the last 150 years or so that says, basically, if, if you know, nice old church ladies clutching their rosaries believe it, then we should probably reject it because it's popular piety and that's somehow bad. But the claims of piety aren't necessarily untrue. That sometimes those claims come down to us for a reason, and I think we basically, we put those on trial just like we do anything else. We accept them until we find reason not to. That, you know, innocent until proven guilty as regards sort of historical claims. So, again, if folk piety or popular piety make a claim, we shouldn't dismiss it out of hand. Kind of like, it's, it's right up there with the idea that, um, that only has currency among atheists on internet forums, that because the Bible is a religious text, and not even because it's a religious text, but because it's a Christian text, um, that we should just ignore it as a historical document. And that isn't really true either, because it contains things that are corroborated by extra-biblical sources, that are corroborated by archaeological finds. Um, about every other day, they find some other coin or inscription or statue or entire city in the Holy Land that verifies something that was said in, in Scripture. And every day when I read those, I'm like, well, this is not terribly impressive. We've been telling you literally since the Bible, the ink dried on the last piece of papyrus, that this is a historical account. And it's a historical account in a way that writings before that weren't. That there's a certain kind of what we would now call historical accuracy or kind of a journalistic accuracy, which in the year 2020 is sort of an interesting phrase to use. Um, but a certain accuracy to what's being written, especially in the Gospels, that didn't happen in religious texts of contemporary religions and, and, and the Jewish scriptures as well. There isn't a lot of mythologizing. There isn't a lot of this natural phenomenon happens and we need an explanation for it, so we have to invent these myths to talk about it. It's rather that, you know, this is just what happened. And sometimes the things that happened are outside of the realm of the natural. But that doesn't mean that they didn't happen, and that doesn't mean that the authors are making them up. Um, but in any, in any event, when we kind of evaluate these claims of piety, one of them, which, you know, one of them has, has kind of long been believed is that Luke and Mary knew one another. Luke sourced Mary. Um, that we, should, we shouldn't dismiss that uh, out of hand. There's another hypothesis, by the way, that's only taken seriously by atheists on Internet forums, and that is that Jesus never existed. No serious academic believes that. No serious academic has believed that for upwards of 50 or 60 years now. And if you ever hear anybody saying that, it's kind of sad because, again, we know that he existed. You could dispute what he did and what he said and when he did what he did and any of that. You know, you can dispute the details, I think, if you're trying to argue from history. 
Um, we, can, we can have a conversation about that, but nobody really takes seriously the idea that he didn't exist. But when we talk about, like I said, claims of piety, innocent till proven guilty, maybe we rate them on a scale of 1 to 10. So did Luke know Mary? I would say that's highly plausible. That's like a 9 and a half. And the reason I say that is because we know a whole lot about Mary, and we know a whole lot about the Holy Family, that Luke could have only gotten either firsthand or from somebody that themselves knew Mary. Um, was Luke a physician? I would say that's also a 9.5 or a 10, because Paul says he was in one of his letters. That's another one of those claims. You know, he's the patron of doctors. He's sometimes depicted with the, the symbols of the medical profession in, in art. Um, he mentions some things in his gospel that sound kind of medical. Um, when he talks about the passion, there's some details in there that a doctor would have thought to include. So was he a doctor? Yeah, pretty, pretty likely, highly plausible that he was. Was Luke an iconographer? This is another one that gets repeated. The image we actually have over here of Our Lady Perpetual Help sometimes is attributed to the evangelist Luke. And there's even this story that he sat in Mary's kitchen and painted it on her kitchen table, and then Mary was like, well, now i got to go to Ikea, or whatever the first century equivalent of Ikea is, and get me a new table, because you painted all over that one. Um, that icon dates really to the 13th or 14th century, and I don't think Luke would have just like risen up from the grave long enough to paint it. Um, the claim that Luke was an iconographer, not terribly likely, or at least we don't have a lot of good evidence of that. We don't have anybody in, in the Gospels saying that. We don't have any icons hanging around that we can date back that far. Um, if there were, they were probably destroyed because there was this unfortunate period in the church where this heresy arose that said that you can't depict the you know Christ and the saints, and so icons all got destroyed. Um, fun fact, if you go to Washington, D.C., to the Freer Gallery of the Smithsonian, it's this little brick building in front of the Smithsonian Castle, they have a manuscript of the Gospels there that has icons on the cover that were painted in the 5th century, and they're some of the oldest icons in the world. The other cool thing about that manuscript is that it's open to a page in Mark where there is a sentence that doesn't exist in any other ancient manuscript of Mark. It's called the Freerologium. It will be in your Bible. In the, it's at the end of Mark's Gospel. They will mention it in, probably in a footnote because it's really weird. Anyway, that aside. So, uh, on to Luke's actual infancy narrative. What is unique to Luke? And the answer is almost all of it. If you look again at our timeline, the points unique to Luke are in green. So you'll see that basically all of it is unique to Luke. We have one point that's absolutely unique to Matthew, and that's the flight into Egypt. And then the other four, like I said, are somehow concurrent in some way or another, at least thematically, broadly speaking. The structure is basically, there's three parts here that we're going to divide it into. The first part is kind of the prologue to the birth of Jesus. It's the origins of John the Baptist and why that's important to who Jesus is. That gives us four narrative points. We have the promise of John the Baptist, the promise of the birth of John um, in uh, Luke 1, 5 to 25, the Annunciation to Mary of the birth of Jesus. So sometimes it'll be called the Annunciation of John and then the Annunciation of Jesus, um, because in both cases, the angel Gabriel comes and he announces the birth of either of 1 John and then, then of Jesus. Then the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, so as soon as Mary finds out that she is to be with child, and the angel tells her, your cousin is in the sixth month of pregnancy. Mary immediately sets out and goes to attend to her. In this, we will get the first of our four Lucan canticles or songs, which is the Magnificat, because I remember them, A, by their liturgical titles, and B, I am kind of a snot, like writing things in Latin. Um, that's going to be verses 46 uh, the latter half of 46 up to 55. It's called the Magnificat because in Latin that's the first word of it. It's used in the liturgy. I'll get into that uh, momentarily. Then the birth of John the Baptist happens shortly thereafter. Um, the visitation is mentioned. Mary remains with Elizabeth for three months. John is born. Mary goes home. Then we have the second of our canticles, the Benedictus. Um, which is, again, named for its first word. The Magnificat, Magnificat means uh, magnify, because the opening line is, my soul magnifies the Lord. Benedictus is blessed, because it begins with, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Um, after these four points that are all unique to Luke, then we have a little bit of a break in the story, because then we get the birth of Jesus. But you can see the Annunciation, we can divide it a little differently. I'm doing it according to what they have in common. Um, but we have two points here. 
an Annunciation and an Annunciation, then the Visitation kind of forms a pivot, and then the birth of John and the birth of Jesus. So again, there's another way, even within this structure, we can, we can kind of break up those points. That's a good way to look at it in terms of story. Like I said, I'm looking at it in terms of what do they have in common in, in parallel. Um, after the birth of Jesus, which, like I said, Luke goes into a little bit more detail about, um, you have the adoration by the shepherds, which, interestingly enough, so the birth is seven verses, the adoration is almost twice that. And it's interesting that that seems to take up a little bit more space. You would think it would, you know, that, that something more important would take up more space, but really, you know, we're just describing the fact that Jesus was born and this is, you know, this is kind of what happened, and you don't have to. I guess there doesn't need to be as much said about that because the adoration by the shepherds and their encounter with the angels, which I singled out here, verses 9 to 14, because that's very important to Luke. Um, because again, Luke mentions angels quite a lot. Luke will mention angels in stories that are unique to him, in narrative points and in parables unique to him. Luke will mention angels in places that the other gospels might recount an, a, the same event, but don't mention angels. So for instance, the Garden of Gethsemane. The angels attend to Jesus in the garden uh, during his agony. They don't in, in, uh, in Matthew and Mark. Um, and then the Gloria is our third canticle there. We only have one verse from it because we only have that first line, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people of goodwill, because the angels were singing in the 2011 translation of the Mass um, and not in the, the one that came out in 1975 that was written the, the International Consultation on English and the Liturgy, the joke about them is that half of them don't speak English and the other half don't speak Latin. And the thing I always observed was that the old translation of the Mass was written by the half that didn't speak Latin and the current one is written by the half that don't speak English. So, <laughs> Anyway, after the angels uh, talk to the shepherds, then we have three more points that kind of close it out. Two of them are unique to Luke. Uh, one of them is not. We have the circumcision and presentation. Uh, the circumcision of Jesus eight days after his birth, his presentation in the temple 40 days after his birth. They are grouped together narratively. You can see that that's 17 consecutive verses there, but they actually would have in time happened uh, kind of far apart from you, know, a month apart from each other, basically. Um, there we get the last of our four canticles, the Nunc Dimittis, now you may let your servant go in peace, which is said by the prophet Simeon, who lives in the temple, upon seeing the infant Messiah. Uh, the next thing in these three final points is common to Matthew and Luke. It's the two-verse editorial comment about the childhood of Jesus. But even then, it's not really a common point because they both say something different. Um, but we're making it a common point again because it's easier to do this if we have four common points. The third is the finding in the temple. So I put a line here to show the, this, the circumcision and presentation happened by the time Jesus is about a month old. The comment about his childhood kind of closes off the infancy. So we can say the infancy narrative ends here. We're including the finding in the temple just because it's the last thing that happens in his childhood that's mentioned in Scripture at all um, until, his, until his public ministry begins. But this happens when he's about 12 years old. So quite a, quite a lot later do we have Jesus um, being lost uh, when his parents are on the pilgrimage uh, to, to Jerusalem for one of the pilgrimage feasts and they find him in the temple. So going back to the events before the birth of Jesus, I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights, because if I were to talk about all these things in detail, we'd be here for a semester. Um, and even I can't talk that long. So John the Baptist's birth is promised. We have Zechariah and Elizabeth. They are advanced in age. They are unable to have children. This is, in the ancient world, a very difficult, very shameful state of affairs because it was believed that those who were barren were somehow cursed for something they had done or something that one of their ancestors had done. Um, there wasn't any reason to think that they were because we know from Luke's account they're very righteous people. They're observant of the law. Zechariah is himself a priest. They're both descended from priestly families. Zechariah, of course, we, we encounter offering sacrifice in the temple because it's his division's turn. Um, Elizabeth is from the daughters of Aaron, so she's from a priestly family as well. Um, their families, again, important. First Chronicles 24. I'll stick that over here. One through 19. 
tells us the names of the priestly divisions, um, and, and it mentions, we have in Luke's Gospel, the division that Zechariah is from, he's from the division of Abia, and it's his division, basically each of the sort of clans within the priestly families would take turns offering sacrifice in the temple, and so it was apparently his turn to go do that. He's serving in the temple in Jerusalem. He's offering the incense. There were different offerings at different times. Incense was offered on the altar of incense every single day. This was the high point of the liturgical services in the morning and in the evening. We carry this over in the Christian tradition because with our liturgy of the hours, our divine office, when solemn morning or evening prayer are prayed, then incense is used. Incense, the incense is uh, used to incense the altar. Um, during the singing of the Magnificat and the Benedictus that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so we, we still have that kind of tradition there that our, our sort of liturgical high points in our divine office and our sort of daily recitation of the Psalms uh, carries with it that burning of incense. It's different from the animal sacrifices and it's different from Yom Kippur, which was kind of the, the one of the chief days for offering sacrifices when the high priest would actually enter into the Holy of Holies, Yom Kippur being the day of atonement, the day that a sacrifice was offered for the sins of the people of Israel. The high priest would go into the, the Holy of Holies, which is the inner sanctum of the temple, um, and they would actually tie a tether to his leg and put bells on his garment so they could tell the bells were there. So if he fell over dead in there, they could hear that he had done that. And that tether was so they could pull him out because nobody was allowed to go in there. They would be struck dead by the presence of God. Um, there were only, only the high priest was allowed to go in there and only once a year. So Zechariah is in the temple, he's offering incense, and the angel Gabriel appears to him and tells him he's going to have a child who's going to be a prophet. He tells what sort of person he's going to be uh, in, this, in this revelation. Zechariah doubts. He says, how is this supposed to happen? You know, I'm, I'm old, we're not supposed to be able to have kids. And he's immediately struck dumb for questioning the angel. Uh, when he exits the altar of incense and can't speak, the people think that he's had some kind of vision, rightfully so. This apparently was not an uncommon occurrence. Like I said, the bells and the, the tether were, uh, in case they had some kind of vision and either, either fell over dead or, or passed out, you know, because they had some kind of vision or apparition, um, and that was so that they didn't have to cross into the sanctuary uh, when, when it wasn't allowed. Um, he returns home to the hill country. We hear that he is uh, in the hill country of Judea, um, which in modern times the hill country is known as Boone. Um, that was a riff on our neighboring parish. Um, the town is, to the, is now called Ein Kerem. Ein, whenever you see E-I-N or A-Y-N, because there is no standard way to Romanize, uh, to put into Latin letters, Arabic or Hebrew. Um, this isn't German. Uh, this isn't the German word for one. It means that there's a spring. And when you go to the town of Ein Kerem, where... Um, and Ein appears in a lot of town names in, in Israel and in, and in a lot of Arab countries. Uh, when you go to Ein Karim, there is, uh, at the bottom, there, there's basically two hills. You're definitely in the hill country, and you have to walk straight up a hill uh, to get to the church, to both the church of John the Baptist on one side, where John was born, and the church of the Visitation, where Mary visited Elizabeth. At the foot of the hill, where the church of the Visitation is, and you have to walk straight up a hill because it's such an old town that it was built before switchbacks were invented, and you, you, know, you just walk straight up. Um, we, have, we have similar engineering on 321 between 40 and, mm -hmm. I'm guessing, the Virginia line, because if you drove that fast enough, I think you'd go into orbit, because it's just a ramp straight up into eternity. <laughs> but, um, but at the foot, of the, the foot of the hill where the Church of the Visitation is at, there is a mosque sitting there, and it's a mosque dedicated to Mary, because the Muslims hold Mary in very high regard. And it is the spot where Mary met Elizabeth when she came into town. And there is still to this day water flowing from underneath it, that there is a spring there. And the story goes that Mary met Elizabeth while Elizabeth was out. Mary was getting into town as Elizabeth had gone out to get water. And this is the town springs. That's where Ein, the Ein and Ein Karim comes from. Although I know a tour guide who re repeatedly refers to it as An Karim, even though he's been there literally a hundred times. So Zechariah goes back home. Ein Karim is not that far. Um, I don't know how long it would take you to walk from Jerusalem to Ein Karim, but it's about a 25-minute drive, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a little while since I've been there, so I don't really remember. Um, it's my favorite little place over there. It reminded me a lot of Assisi, actually. It's just this little 
kind of mountain town, um, little little cafes and things, but then also these two, you know, lovely churches right at the top of the, the hills on either side. Um, so Zechariah goes home, and then Elizabeth ends up uh, pregnant, uh, even though that was not thought to be something able to happen, but, you know, when an archangel appears and tells you if that's going to happen, chances are you can take that to the bank. The next thing that we hear about is the Annunciation to Mary, a few highlights of that. The angel appears. We just heard this uh, gospel read the other day because the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. We're actually going to hear it, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to hear it again on Sunday because the gospel for the um, for uh, Gaudete Sunday is also the Annunciation. Then we'll hear it again um, on Christmas itself. And I'm pretty sure it's also one of the options for the gospel in the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So basically, once you get past December 1st, you read this gospel at Mass at least four times. Um, we really want to get the point across. So the angel greets Mary, and the Greek text of Luke's gospel says that the angel's words are chaira kekare tomine. Um, chaira means hi or hello, or we might say hail, uh, if we're being, being wonderfully uh, archaic. Um, and kekare tomine is a very interesting word. Obviously, it's an interesting word because it's in Greek. Um, all the interesting words are in Greek. So the word, and I'm writing it up here not because, I'm writing it up here because I'm confident that all of you know Greek, <laughs> but actually because I want to dissect it a little bit. If you don't know Greek and you'd like to, I'm happy to teach Greek. Okay, so this middle part here, the chari part, um, is the perfect past participle of the verb charitu. Um, so a perfect past participle, what that means is that it is something that has already been completed but is an ongoing state of being. Um, so it's something that has been done but also is still as it is. Um, as, as one commentator puts it, it expresses the full intensity of action, something completed but still, still like that. Mary was perfectly graced. Charitu means grace. Um, it might also be translated as favor. You'll see some translations that say, um, hail favored one, or hail highly favored daughter, which is totally not what it literally says. It doesn't say daughter in there at all. Um, <clears throat> so Mary was perfectly graced and remains so. She's perfected in grace. This is the only time this word occurs in ancient literature at all. Not just in the Gospels, not just in the New Testament, but anywhere. That if you open a Greek lexicon and you look at how many mentions of this word there are, there's exactly one in all of the literature written in ancient Greek. And what that probably then suggests is that Luke, in order to convey this, had to create this term to translate what the angel would have said, which he probably would have said in Aramaic because that, you know, that would have been the language that Mary would have understood. Or maybe he was speaking somehow with a defied words, but this is the meaning that's conveyed. But in order to get the meaning that's conveyed, Luke probably had to come up with this term. The other interesting thing about this is this ending here, this eta, um, is a means it's in the vocative. The vocative is the so in English we don't do this, which is unfortunate because it makes English a far less agile language than some of the ancient languages. But you have a grammatical case. We actually kind of do it, but we use helping words to to make it happen. But case refers to basically what is a noun or. Uh, an adjective that modifies it doing in the sentence. So the nominative case is the subject of the sentence. The genitive is usually the possessive. It's words you translate as of something. Um, the accusative case is the object of the sentence. The vocative case is when you use a form of address. So when you're listening to uh, prayers being said in Latin, or you're saying your prayers in, in Latin, when you say domine, um, the nominative is dominus. So that's the Lord. But if we said domini, that would be of the Lord. Domine is when you're saying, oh Lord, when you're speaking to the Lord. So that's how that would work. This is actually written in the vocative. What that means is when the angel says, Chaire Tomine, is Mary's name. That's the name by which he's addressing her. <clears throat> so the Annunciation account is interesting, not because of what Mary does, but because of what Mary doesn't do. Um, it says that she was tr greatly troubled and wondered what sort of greeting this might be. Um, she doesn't cower in fear. She doesn't prostrate on the ground. She doesn't cover her face the way everybody else in Scripture does when they encounter an angel. Everybody else in Scripture freaks out 
at the sight of an angel because angels are really powerful and they're the messengers of God and they mediate God's presence to people. So people, when they're in the presence of an angel, in the Old Testament, there's a couple of instances where they think they're actually seeing God and they fall down and worship, but also they cover their faces and look away because being in the, uh, the kind of the, the unmediated presence of God, which is what they think they're seeing, uh, can annihilate a sinful and finite person. Mary doesn't do that. She passes immediately to how the angel is greeting her, the name that he's calling her by. Um, so it's, it's almost like having an angel showing up in her, in her bedroom in the middle of the afternoon just isn't a big deal. It's, like, it's almost like it's something that ha has happened before. Um, this points to the Immaculate Conception. Saying she's full of grace uh, makes that case, but her response to the angel and the angel's response to her makes that even more. Um, and the angel's response to her, you know, he comes in and he says that she'll be with child. And she says, how can this be? So there's two important things going on here. First, there is a tradition that says that Mary took a vow of virginity from her, from her birth. There are some early documents, some of them um, non-canonical, uh, you know, some, some non-canonical documents that were maybe false scripture at one point, some other allusions to this. Um, she asks the question not because she doesn't understand where babies come from, because she's about to get married, and she would have to know that in order to get married. Um, but it's not going to be how she's, she has taken this, if she's taken this vow, then having children is out of the question for her. That's not something that's going to be part of how she lives her life. Um, the second interesting thing that's going on here, Mary questions the angel. When Zechariah questions the angel, he's struck dumb for doubting. Um, Mary is not. Mary is not, the angel doesn't reprimand her, doesn't take away her ability to speak. And some will say that's because Mary asked in faith that Zechariah asked in doubt. But there really isn't, if you read what it says, there isn't any fundamental difference between how they ask their questions. There isn't anything to indicate that. It doesn't say that Mary set up and full of faith said this, and Zechariah was being an idiot, and he you know, says this. It doesn't say that. It doesn't indicate that. Um, but this is an example of kind of a pious statement that's less well attested when there's really a better way of looking at it. So the, the statement that Mary asks in faith and Zechariah doubts, um, Mary is immaculately conceived, and she's allowed to kind of talk to the angel on those terms. Zechariah is just a normal human being, and he's not. Um, so it's, it's basically that in the, the great chain of being that in, in your philosophy 101 class you learn about where there's, there's sort of this hierarchy of beings, there's inanimate objects, and there's plants, and there's animals, and then there's human beings who have a rational soul, and then there's angelic beings, and then there's God. Mary ranks somewhere above the angels because she's been immaculately conceived and is able to um, have the presence of God dwelling within her womb, which is something that wouldn't be able to happen if she were sinful and finite because it would annihilate her. Um, there's a parallel there with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament um, has the presence of God overshadowing it, which is the word the angel uses to describe how Mary will conceive, that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her, and she'll be with child by the Holy Spirit. The ark contains within it foreshadowing of the Christ, because it has the tablets of the law, and Christ is the law giver of the new covenant. It has the, and Christ at several points assumes a, a position where he is teaching on top of a mountain to show that he's giving the new law. There's the priestly staff of Aaron, and Christ is the great high priest who offers himself on the cross. And then the, some of the manna from the desert is, is found in the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven. And so uh, all of, the, all of the, the things found in the Ark foreshadow Mary herself and who she will bear within her womb. Um, so in any event, Mary is allowed to talk to the angel because she's the queen of the angels, um, Zechariah is like a private questioning his general. And if you've seen the movie Patton, you know that doesn't go very well for the private most of the time. Elizabeth is a sign of what will come to Mary. This is something that the angel, when Mary asked how is she supposed to have children if she's taking a vow of virginity, um, Elizabeth is a sign, you know, your relative who was thought barren um, is now going to have a child. Um, and then, and so in that way, it's, it, you know, we see again the reason that the stories of John the Baptist and Jesus are so closely tied is that John foretells the coming of Jesus even by how he's conceived and even by how he, you know, how he comes into the world. Um, after all this is explained to her, Mary 
says, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departs. Um, Mary goes with haste. As soon as she hears that Elizabeth is pregnant, she departs for Ein Karim. Um, she has Jesus dwelling within her and so immediately acts with charity. That's kind of, that's meant to be an example for the faithful that, you know, again, here, here Mary has, has received the, you know, has, has now conceived within her womb by the Holy Spirit, has conceived Christ within her, um, and that, that having Jesus within her, you know, sort of impels her to act with such great charity. Um, Mary encounters Elizabeth, and John leaps in his mother's womb as soon as Mary greets Elizabeth, which, uh, you know, to acknowledge the presence of Jesus, which, again, John's entire life points the way to Jesus, even, even when he's still in the womb. Um, Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth somehow knows that Mary is with child, and Mary's with child, not just any child, but, you know, the Son of God. Um, this is a powerful statement here of Jesus's divinity, um, that, that she says, the mother of my Lord. Uh, Elizabeth praises Mary's faith, blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. The Hail Mary, which we think of as something distinctively Catholic, if anybody ever tells you that Catholics uh, don't, don't read the Bible or don't know scripture or whatever, um, the Hail Mary is almost entirely composed of lines from scripture, mostly taken from the Gospel of Luke, Hail Mary full of grace, we get that from the angel Gabriel, um, the Lord is with you, and then blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, this is from the words of Elizabeth. Mary responds with her hymn of praise, as we said, the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord. Um, there's a wonderful, um, in one of John Paul II's encyclicals, he's talking about uh, devotion to Mary, and he says the words of the Magnificat are very simple and wholly inspired by the sacred texts of the people of Israel. I gave you a handout that tells you what sacred texts those are. Um, in the Jerusalem Bible, um, I'm pretty sure in the English edition, but definitely in the French edition, which is where I took this from when I wrote a paper about this about six years ago, um, there's, it actually tells you which verses of the Old Testament each line of the Magnificat would have been inspired by. And so the key text is 1 Samuel, um, the, uh, the canticle of Hannah, that there's an almost one-to-one -one parallel when Hannah sings her, her song, uh, Mary's is kind of meant to mirror that. There's a school of thought that says that Mary never really said the Magnificat because there's this school of biblical thought that says that anything that's fun or interesting we should just you know pretend never happened or reject out of hand as being some kind of kind of pious legend. Um, that the, the Magnificat was something Luke made up. He took a bunch of Old Testament verses and he has Mary step up and sing the Magnificat, but she didn't really ever say that. Um, I would disagree with that because we know that Mary was um, a very holy woman. She was, you know, a very devout woman. We hear about her and her family going to the pilgrimage feasts in Jerusalem. She would have been a regular worshiper in her own, you know, in her Jewish faith. She would have known the words of Scripture because she would have been hearing these things read all the time and recited in the daily prayers. Um, the, the daily Jewish prayer would have been the Psalms and the Canticles of the Old Testament. She would have been familiar with these texts. So it's not out of the question to say that she actually said the Magnificat. And again, we take a claim that's found on the face of Scripture, and we have to evaluate it in light of the evidence. And there's no evidence to say that Mary wouldn't have said that. Um, and again, there are Old Testament influences there. Um, yeah, the Canticles, um, I'll get into kind of more broadly about them in just a moment, but let's look, let's kind of close off the, the narrative itself. Um, Mary stays with Elizabeth for three months, the implication being that she stays there until John is born, because again, Elizabeth is six months pregnant when Mary comes along. Then the birth of John the Baptist, Elizabeth's neighbors rejoice. They rejoice that her reproach has been taken away, because sterility, again, was a very uh, shameful condition in the ancient world. And they rejoice along with her as she herself says that her reproach has been taken away. The curse has been lifted, as it were. Uh, the naming of John. There is no one in his family by that name. She says, you know, and, and they ask, um, they ask Zechariah, you know, what are you going to name him? And he writes on this tablet, he shall be called John. His name is John. Um, children were usually named after a man in their direct line. That's why you see a lot of people with Ben in their name. Ben means son. Um, and in, in modern uh, in modern Arabic, when you say bean or eben, depending on the 
the, uh, the structure of the vowels or whatever in the, in the name, that also means son of. So those Ben names are son of somebody. Um, we see, like later on in Matthew's Gospel, uh, when, when Jesus addresses Peter, he says, Blessed are you, Simon ben uh, Jonah, Simon son of Jonah or Simon son of John. Um, so Ben means son of. Um, so Zechariah writes down, he shall be called John, and suddenly he's able to speak. And the first thing that he says, uh, joyful words, this canticle of praise, uh, which is a prophecy about who his son will be. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited his people and set them free. He goes on to say, you child shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. This echoes the words of Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. This is applied elsewhere to John the Baptist, that John is the voice crying out in the wilderness. Um, and we see that especially at the beginning of Mark's gospel, because like I said, Mark skips over all of it and goes straight to John the Baptist, and that's what is said of him there. The child grew and became strong. He went out into the wilderness until his manifestation to Israel. Uh, this is going to show up later. He goes out baptizing Apparently, he's going into the wilderness to prepare. We will hear that Jesus does the same thing to prepare for his ministry. Um, then we have our, like I said, those two points that Matthew and Luke have in common, the birth and the adoration. Um, in this case, the adoration by the, the shepherds. Um, Luke's birth uh, narrative, like I said, is seven verses. It's Luke situating this within history. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. The whole world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Luke's, Luke likes those historical details. Um, Joseph goes from Galilee, uh, from a town of Nazareth to Judea. You can look on the back of your handout. You have a map, or the last handout there. There's a map you can see. Um, Galilee is going to be up here in the north. The Sea of Galilee is this lake right here. Uh, we think of sea, we think of like a huge body of water and even a huge body of salt water. The Sea of Galilee is a big lake. It's about the size of Lake Norman near Huntersville and Mooresville above Charlotte. Um, and it's fresh water. And it's, um, I've uh, been out on a boat on it. It actually stormed, I think, two of the three times I've been on a boat on it. So that was kind of cool. Um, Did you see anybody walking? No. <laughs> I was going to try. But, you know, insurance. Um, so they go from Nazareth, which is uh, kind of... If you look where the city of Tiberias is, and you look kind of the southwest of Tiberias, is Nazareth, um, out away from it a little bit, kind of situated on a hill. And they go from there to Bethlehem, which is down near Jerusalem. Jerusalem is here in kind of the south central part of what we would call Syria Palestine in those days, the Roman province of Syria Palestine. Directly south of that is the little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light. Um, they go down there to be enrolled because that's where his family uh, would have been from because they are descended from David. Uh, Luke mentions this because, again, his Jewish audience will perk up at the mention of da the name of David because the Messiah is supposed to be born in David's line. Matthew is going to have a field day with David that we will get into because we're talking mostly about his account of the genealogy, which is all centered around Jesus' descent from David. Um, it says, while they were there, two verses is our birth narrative. While they were there, the time came for her to have her child. She gave birth. Her firstborn son, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I think I mentioned this last time. The question is, was Jesus born in a stable? Was he born in a house? Was he born in, a, in an inn? And the answer is all of the above because the word that is used uh, by Luke there refers to basically just kind of the spare room where you might keep the animals when it's cold. You might use as a larder part of the time. Um, so it was a place for feeding, it was a place for, for tucking away the animals when it got cold, and it was a place to stash your guests, um, because in those days, apparently they didn't like their guests as much as we do now, and we made them sleep in the garage. Um, <laughs> if you ever come over to my house, I don't have a garage, so good luck with that. The shepherds, of course, come to adore him, um, and they, you know, then they go out and they spread the word as to what has happened. Um, then we get into the we go back into these things that are unique to Luke. This last section has three narrative points, two of them unique to Luke. Um, on the eighth day, Jesus is circumcised according to the law. He's given the name Jesus. This is to reflect also what happened with John the Baptist. There's no one on his father's side named that. The name Jesus is the Greek version of um, the Hebrew name Joshua or Yeshua. 
You'll hear some evangelicals and some uh, some of these the Messianic Jews that are they're not really Jewish. They are evangelical Christians who wear wear a yarmulke and um, make a big deal about saying half of the things they say about Jesus in Hebrew, and they will call him Yeshua. Um, to uh, Jesus is the is actually the anglicization of the Latin pronunciation of the Greek version of the name Joshua. Um, there's nobody on his father's side named that, but that's the, the name that they, they give him. After this, when the time comes for the purification, which is spelled out in the law, <clears throat> they go to the temple, they offer a sacrifice for the firstborn, two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Um, this was the offering of someone who was poor. Uh, because the, the law, um, and I'm, it escapes me right now which of the books of the Torah this is in, I think it's in Leviticus, that the offering for the firstborn is either two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Um, if you are poor, um, there's an option for a better offering if you are not, but they would have been of modest means. Joseph was a worker. Uh, he, the Greek word we translate as carpenter was techne, which just means... It doesn't just mean carpentry. It could be any kind of skilled labor. He was just kind of a kind of a working man, kind of a general contractor, so to speak. Um, but because uh, his last name wasn't Vinoy, he didn't make nearly as much as you would make doing that now. <clears throat> Local humor. Um, when they go to the temple, they meet the prophet Simeon and the prophetess Anna. Simeon holds the infant Christ, recognizes him as the Messiah, and sings his canticle. I won't hold you in suspense any longer. We're talking about the canticles. There are four canticles. Really, there are three, but we're going to say there's four because apparently I've developed this, obs this obsession with number four, which is probably not good because in Japan, where 13 is our unlucky number, four is theirs because one of the two words that can be used to mean four uh, is, is, um, sounds the same. It's a homophone of the word for death. So um, there are four canticles, three of them, one of them that we're probably the most familiar with is the one sung, sung by the angels, Glory to God in the Highest. And on earth, peace to people of goodwill, which we then develop into a very long liturgical hymn that we sing at Mass. Um, the other three that are used in the Liturgy of the Hours, the Canticle of Mary, the Magnificat that we heard when she meets Elizabeth, uh, her hymn of praise for the great things that God has done, and, and really kind of a meditation on how the coming of the Christ is going to sort of reverse everything that was broken by sin. Um, he has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up lowly. He has filled the hunger with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Um, so there's there's that kind of, um, that sort of reversal that's occurring because the Christ has come into the world. The canticle of Zechariah, the hymn of praise, that God has blessed him with this son, whom he has named John, and John will be a prophet, and it's a prophecy of his being a prophet. And then the canticle of Simeon, now, now, Lord, you may let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation uh, which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations or a light of revelation to the Gentiles is another way to translate it, and the glory of your people Israel. Um, so Luke is the only gospel that has the canticles. It's an important part of his writing style. Um, as I said, we use them liturgically. In the church, the Canticle of Zechariah, the Benedictus, is used at morning prayer. The Canticle of Mary is used in evening prayer. And the Canticle of Simeon is used in night prayer. Because night prayer, again, the words, you know, now you may let your servant go in peace. Here's an old man who was promised he would see the Messiah. He gets to an old age. He sees the Messiah. And now he basically says, Lord, now you can let me die. If you go and look in the, in the breviary, in the, in the book of the Liturgy of the Hours, the prayers, the implication behind all the prayers and night prayer is that night prayer is meant to be a rehearsal for death, just as sleep is meant to be a rehearsal for death. In the Spanish version of the breviary, it gets even more visceral because there's a hymn for one of the nights of night prayer that's literally called Sleep the Brother of Death. Um, and the idea being that just as you are to prepare for the end of your day before you go to sleep by praying and, and sort of commending your soul to God, um, that, that that should be practiced for the end of your life when you commend your soul to God and fall asleep in the Lord. So Luke's the only gospel that has the canticles. Luke is using good Greco-Roman historical conventions, and the canticles are evidence of that. In the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides, which are the two main historians we have that, that their writings have survived to the present day, uh, whenever a general would win a battle, he would do a show-stopping musical number. He would step up and he would sing his victory song. 
um, because Herodotus and Thucydides got their start on Broadway. And <laughs> Luke frames the canticles in much the same way. So whenever something momentous has happened, the central figure sings a victory song. Does this mean that Luke made them up? Not necessarily. It doesn't really have to be either or. Luke can have them saying these things, but frame them in that way so as to highlight the fact that he's using this sort of historical convention that would have been familiar to his Greek audience. He's depicting a real event, you know, that, that Mary, you know, recites this hymn of praise as, as this, this wonderful thing happens, as Elizabeth, you know, sort of proclaims, here's the mother of my Lord. Um, these songs of joy, you know, these are, this is an authentic joy that's expressed by these people, but Luke is framing it in a way that his audience is going to be familiar with. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that Simeon says, so that after that brief aside where I no longer hold you in suspense, and um, you, you can go back to thinking about more interesting things. Um, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and a sign to be spoken against. Simeon is giving a prophecy not only about who Jesus is supposed to be, he's going to be the Messiah, he's going to set things right, he's going to suffer, um, he's, going to, he's going to die. The sign to be contradicted refers to, you know, eventually looking ahead to the Passion. Um, going back to Fulton Sheen's Life of Christ, he talks about how the cross casts a shadow backwards across the whole life of Jesus. And so this proclamation of who Christ is, you know, from this prophet Simeon points to that. Here's the Passion already being mentioned when Jesus is only a month old. Um, but he also speaks of Mary's role. He says to her, a sword will pierce your soul too. This parallels the prophecy of what kind of man John the Baptist would be. It'd be interesting to study these parallels in greater depth. I probably wrote that there thinking that I would have lots of time before the next advent to expand these notes and to, um, to do that, and I haven't. So, uh, The mention of Anna, the prophetess, lives in the temple area. She, was a, she married. She was widowed after being married for a few years, and then she lived in the temple Kind of analogous to what we would now call a consecrated religious, like a nun or something. Um, obviously, they didn't have Christian religious orders before there was Christianity. Um, and at this point, didn't have Christian religious orders before there was a Christ, because he wouldn't have been born um, at the time she would have done this, because it said she's been living in the temple for quite some time. Um, but something kind of analogous is that, something kind of prefiguring that in a certain way. Um, because we know that you know that monastic tradition, that consecrating oneself to God, will start almost immediately, as soon as Christianity kind of catches a break from persecution in the early centuries. People go out to the desert to, to live the monastic life more openly, although in some cases they were fleeing persecution. That's why they went to the desert. Um, the finding of the temple, like I said, we skip ahead from when Jesus is 40 days old to um, when he's 12. They're going to Jerusalem for Passover, which is one of the great pilgrimage feasts. They've traveled a day, and then they get down the road, and they realize they don't have Jesus with them. The, the Joseph and Mary realize that. They seek him for three days, and they find him in the temple listening and asking them questions. I always think it's interesting that we think of the finding in the temple as one of the joyful mysteries. It certainly was joyful that they found him, but, I mean, imagine losing your child for upwards of a week. And, you know, that, that that's not joyful. That's kind of terrifying. And the joy is in finding him again. But, you know, it sort of, uh, again, kind of expresses who Jesus is and what his life is going to be, that that joy will come at the end of what would have been a very, very, you know, anguished time for them. And they even say that, you know, they say, you know, where were you? Did you not know we would be sort of preoccupied about, about this? And he says, did you not know I must be uh, in my father's house? And they're not really, they don't really understand what he meant by that. <clears throat> um, Jesus returns with them to Nazareth. He's obedient to them and he grows up in kind of a normal human upbringing this, refer, this is what Paul refers to in his writings as the kenosis, the emptying of Christ. Um, even though he's God, he still submits to the human condition and kind of what that implies apart from sin. Obviously, he never sins, but he, he knows a normal human upbringing. He lives the life of the family. He lives as a worker working alongside his father, you know, would have been, would have been going around and doing, you know, doing, he would have kind of apprenticed to his father. Um, before his public ministry begins. So he lives just this normal sort of mundane existence uh, in this great emptying that even though he is God, he, you know, lowers himself, kind of brings himself to our level. And he does that so as to sort of consecrate uh, the life of the family and to consecrate sort of the everyday reality so that we can encounter Christ even when we're at work um, because Christ went to work too, uh, you know, in the, in the three decades before he appears in public. Uh, and begins his ministry. 
Mary kept all these things in her heart. Um, this is a callback to the adoration of the shepherds. When the shepherds come, um, it says that Mary ponders what they have said, what they heard from the angel, what they have said about Jesus. She ponders these things in her heart. Here's perhaps the clearest and most adamant statement that Luke is sourcing Mary directly. Mary kept these things in her heart, so only she really knew about them. So she would have had to have revealed them to someone in order for that to have been written down, unless Luke was just making that up. But it doesn't really, again, we already have established that Luke wants to do good, accurate history, so I don't know why he would just sort of throw in some spurious details like that. Um, maybe we could set off the narrative of the childhood within the two mentions of this phrase. That's another technique that you will see in studying scripture called an inclusio. An inclusio is where you will have a phrase repeated on either side of like a section of, of verses or even kind of at the beginning and the end of a chapter. Sometimes the chapters are divided up like that. Remember that chapter and verse didn't come about until about the 13th century. Um, there were a couple of scholars that started to versify the Bible because it was easier to read that way. Um, when the when the texts, when the ancient texts were written, if you go to a museum uh, and you see biblical, like leaves of biblical manuscripts that date to the 5th and 6th century, which is some of the oldest ones we've got, um, that they're not, not only are there not chapters and verses, there aren't even spaces between the letters, that it's just a big block of text, that there, are, there aren't spaces between the words, there's no punctuation, that that kind of thing didn't even come about until, you know, again, kind of till the, the early Middle Ages. There's a, a writing in, um, in Augustine's Confessions, which was written in the 4th century, when he first meets Ambrose of Milan, the bishop who will bring about his conversion, he encounters Ambrose, and Ambrose is sitting there reading quietly, which we don't think anything of that. We read quietly all the time. But in the ancient world, because texts were written just with just big blocks of letters, and, and um, they, you had to kind of read them out loud in order to get the meaning of what was being said, because they were written without punctuation, without spacing between the words, without diacritical marks to tell you how to pronounce things or how to emphasize them. Um, because we, because he, see, he sees Ambrose sitting there reading quietly, he's amazed at this, and he realizes Ambrose must be some kind of genius because he's able to read without doing it out loud. Um, so, so, um, so again, the, the chapters and verses come along much later, but sometimes an inclusio is where you set off a block of text between the repetition of a phrase or the repetition of a word. Um, a good example of this is in Hebrews 13, which you will remember I mentioned at some length at the beginning of last week's talk because I have studied it just a little bit because uh, I wrote my thesis on it in the seminary. Um, that this, when I went to study the words that I wanted to study, I had to set off within a section of verses where those words occurred. And it, it just so happens that in Hebrews 13, 7, it says, remember your leaders. And then in Hebrews 13, 17, it says, remember your leaders. And so 13, 15 that I was actually writing about happens in the middle of this inclusio. Um, which is a, you know, kind of that. So it would be, be interesting to study the narrative of the childhood of Jesus between those two uses of the phrase, she kept these things in her heart and pondered them. Um, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Again, this is that emptying. Um, he is fully God and fully man, but he grew up as any of us would have. He had a normal human upbringing. He grew up and he you know, learn from his father and, and mother. And like I said, you'll see, you know, I think we can read that in the Gospels that, that we, don't, we don't hear Joseph ever say anything, but Joseph speaks eloquently through the, the words of his adoptive son, that there are times when Jesus says and does things that you look at that and you go, you know, this is something that his father would have taught him. Uh, one of the biggest examples of that is, you know, when we hear that in, in Matthew's gospel that Joseph wants to divorce Mary quietly so she's not exposed to the penalty for being found with child outside of marriage, um, which, you know, the implication being that she's committed adultery and they, you know, that they, she doesn't, he doesn't want to expose her to that penalty, which is to be stoned to death. So he wants to just kind of divorce her quietly and not make a big thing of this to, to preserve her life. Think, think then, you know, fast forward to when Jesus comes to the, you know, this woman caught in adultery, they're about to stone her to death, and he says, he who, let he who's without sin cast the first stone. There's an echo of the actions of Joseph even in that. So, um, so Jesus was, you know, fully God and fully man, but he also allowed himself to submit to kind of a normal human upbringing. And this is one of those things that a lot of people really wrestle with, that theology has wrestled with, that, you know, how is it we can kind of say both things, that here is the all-powerful God who created the universe, but also he allows himself to be a baby, and to live in then kind of a normal human family. And it's, you know, 
it's one of the things that that we would say is kind of kind of you know, on some level fundamentally mysterious and and really in accord with you know that's what his will was is to live like that to be an example and again to consecrate that life for us so that takes us to the end of Luke's um, infancy narrative and next week we will talk about Matthew and we'll really focus on two things in Matthew one is the uh, flight into Egypt um, which will drive us insane and the other is the genealogy and compare Matthew and Luke's genealogy so glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen